I would honestly say that surgery is a younger person's field. Um, you know, I was uh, 40 when I retired from the Navy. Um, and uh, it's very hard on your body, the concrete floor, standing in one spot. Hello. Hi. Hi, Do Dr. Kane. Yes, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good, good. Thank you so much for coming on. Sure, I'm happy to. Thank you. So guys, um, welcome to eShadowing as always. As you all know, I'm Rodalyn. I'm the host of eShadowing. And to, tonight I have Dr. Scott Kane. Kane, I'm sorry, who is the okay. director at Nova Southeastern University, Fort Myers campus, which happens to be the PA school I went to. Um, oh. Oh, yeah, Dr. Kane wasn't there at the time. Oh. Oh graduated in 2016 we had um dr patch okay yep yeah, so dr dr patch is actually the program director at um um Bernal university yeah. yes yes yeah i connected with her a few months ago but yeah and i'm in georgia so it was like wow <laughs> oh that's great thank you um so Dr. Kane's not only an academic director now, but he also has um, his past work in psychiatry and head and neck surgery. Um, so we're excited to learn about your journey to PA, of course, how long you've been a PA, all your experiences um, as a PA, and um, excited to basically hear your expertise and knowledge that you have to share with us. Sure. Good. Glad to meet you. So um, as, as, um, as she said, my name is Scott Kane. I've been a PA for eight years. Um, that being said, you can see um, up there, I spent 20 years in the Navy as a hospital foreman. Wow. Uh, I started off as a surgical tech and specialized in head and neck surgery, which you mentioned. Uh, after about 10 years or so, I started to get a little bit bored being in the Navy and being at a Naval hospital. I decided to um, throw myself into the frying pan and go back to training. Uh, and I went to California to become a combat medic and spent about six years with the U.S. Marines as an independent duty uh, fleet Marine Force corpsman. So I was deployed uh, with the Marines as an independent duty corpsman. Um, and uh, that was a amazing experience. I learned a lot there, um, but I was not a PA yet. I tried to do the PA program in the Navy. It is extremely difficult and highly selective. And it just wasn't meant to be. I um, couldn't make it happen. So I retired from the Navy and had just finished my bachelor's degree. And um, I was going to Old Dominion University, which is in Norfolk, Virginia, and applied to Eastern Virginia Medical School's PA program. And I was lucky I got in first try. Um, it was actually the only school I applied to. I didn't want to go anywhere else. Um, so I just didn't want to move. I was already settled from... Um, retiring from the Navy. So uh, I went to EVMS and about a month before graduation, I went on a job interview in a little um, psychiatry practice, actually not little, um, seven psychiatry staff psychiatrists. And when I met with the head psychiatrist, he told me about their plan for um, hiring some PAs. And he wanted to know who I thought would be good as well as myself. And he ended up hiring three Three of myself and two other students from my class and a student from Wake Forest. So four brand new PAs in a psychiatry practice with seven uh, staff psychiatrists. So we all worked there. They trained us together and it was really a phenomenal experience. I did a lot of, a lot of outpatient psychiatry and um, the practice ended up closing. The senior partner retired and um, we were looking to move to Florida Uh my dad lives over in Fort Lauderdale, so I wanted to kind of come down to where it was warm and be near my dad. So, um, so I was working in psychiatry. Um, after the first year, I completed my NCCPA Certificate of Additional Qualifications. Um, when you guys become PAs, you'll find out about that. Um, not too many people do it. Um, surprisingly, uh, just interestingly as a statistic, about 1% of PAs work in psychiatry but about 40% of us have the CAQ. And as far as the CAQ, I think only about 5% of PAs actually have it. Most PAs don't, don't do the additional board exam to get it. But um, so I got my CAQ in psychiatry and uh, 
moved to Florida and uh, started working in psychiatry as soon as I got here and then heard about a position opening at Nova Southeast University, started teaching and still seeing psychiatry patients one day a week. Um, after about the three years, I got promoted to academic director, which is the position I'm in now. And I run the whole didactic program. I make the schedule. Um, I meet with students. I, I, um, I'm on the curriculum committee. I'm also co-chair of the admissions committee. Um, what else? Oh, I've on a whole bunch of different committees. And um, so that's, so I've been um, with Nova Southeastern University about four and a half, just short of five years now. Um, let me see. Uh, last year, I finished my doctoral degree at University of Lynchburg in medical science. Gotcha. And that's, uh, thank you. And um, yeah, I still practice outpatient psychiatry one day a week. It's my, my true passion. Um, it's what I really, um, before I said, went to PA school, I decided I wanted to do psychiatry. And then all the instructors said, keep an open mind. Don't get pinned to one specialty. And I kept an open mind. I did all my different rotations. And my second to last rotation was psychiatry. And I remembered why I love psychiatry. And that was what I was meant to do. So um, that's how it worked out for me. Thank you. So first of all, I want to say thank you so much for your service um, in the military as a um, in the Navy. So thank you so much for that. And, I appreciate that. Um, I wanted to ask, um, what made you want to do psychiatry over, you know, continuing, you know, your your path in uh, surgery, being that you were you did some surgical work? Um, yeah. So surgery is, I would honestly say that surgery is a younger person's field. Um, you know, I was uh, 40 when I retired from the Navy, um, and uh, it's very hard on your body. The concrete floor, standing in one spot um, with your head basically down, and you're, you know, you have to keep your arms up. You can't let your hand, so you're, it's hard on your shoulders, your neck. So um, there was that. So I, I knew I didn't really want to be doing that again. And when I was with the Marines, I, I really found that so many of them suffered from mental health problems. And the, the most difficult part was they felt they couldn't come forward with their symptoms because as soon as the Marine Corps found out that they had mental health problems, they wanted to send them home. And, and these um, Marines uh, do not quit and they would not leave their brothers behind. So they, they minimized their symptoms and they would, we would work with them, but we couldn't really officially do anything. And I spent a lot of time just talking with them and trying to help them work through things and um, just opened my eyes to how big of a problem it is for our veterans. Right. Uh, so that was, I was drawn to it and I did it. And I remember a specific experience in Kuwait that, I mean, set me on this path. There was a, I mean, I, I can tell you really quick. So um, I was working for a battalion surgeon. I had zero experience in psychiatry. Um, I had been trained as an independent duty corpsman, but we didn't have any psychiatry training. And a young Marine grabbed me and said, one of the Marines locked himself in the porta potty with a loaded rifle and was going to shoot himself in the head. And uh, I'm, I'm like, okay, well, go find, go find the battalion surgeon. You know, I, I don't know what to do. And they said, well, we can't find him. He's, he's out on a flight or something. And I said, all right, well, where is he? They took me over to him and uh, they said, you know, talk to him. You need to, you know, talk to him. And I talked to him for about a half hour and, um, I was really scared. And I said to myself, I had the realization that if he really wanted to hurt himself, he probably would have done it already. And I, I think he, he was just, he wanted somebody to hear what was going on with him. And I talked to him, he came out, he did end up, did end up getting sent home, but, um, he lived, I saw him six months later and he was doing great. Um, so that experience was one of the most frightening experiences for me, but really eye opening that what you'll discover as a PA is you just have to listen to your patients. Just let them tell you what's going on with them. And if you listen, they will know you care. That's, that's all you have to do is listen. Right. I mean, obviously there's more, but you, you have to listen. So, yeah. So that's how I knew that that was what I wanted to do. Thank you so much for that touching story. Um, and also you applied to one PA school. <laughs> um, you an exceptional candidate, I'm sure. So uh, how did you feel going in, you know, applying? Oh. I'm sure you were, of course, like, as I said, you were a great candidate being that you had like all these years of experience, you had life experience, you had patient care hours. 
Oh yeah. Um, like, how did you feel? How was the interview? Like, how was the process like? And what? What? Um, I'm not sure if you mentioned like what made you just want to just apply to one school, like. Right. So I I was living in Virginia Beach, and the closest school was Eastern Virginia Medical School in Norfolk, and I decided that if I first year I would just apply to one school. If I didn't get in, then I would kind of open up to other other options. I really didn't want to move. That was part A. Part B was, uh, as I was a non-traditional student, I hadn't taken the GRE in 10 years. So um, I knew that if I took the GRE, I would have to take a prep course and my scores probably wouldn't be that good. And luckily for me, EVMS did not require the GRE. So um, it kind of made it logical for me to go there and to apply there. So um, the interview process was very intimidating. Um, I uh, was still in the Navy. I decided that, that I wanted to go there. I met with one of the professors and said, can you look at my my transcripts, my my um, experience and, and tell me what I need to do? And luckily he met with me and he said, you're, you're a good candidate. He said, what you need to do is you need to retake these three classes and you need to get A's in them. And then you need to apply. And that's exactly what I did. I retook three classes and, and got A's in them and uh, went to the interview and was extremely nervous, even with my 40,000 hours of healthcare experience, 20 years of 2,000 hours a, a year. Um, I was still very nervous. So, um, but uh, they saw that, um, you know, that the roots of, of PA, the PA profession, um, as we know, is Navy corpsman. And, um, that made me an, even a better candidate because I was kind of the traditional, you know, what, where we came from. So right. it was lucky for me. So um, if I hadn't gotten in, I would have applied to multiple different schools. I think most people have to apply to multiple programs. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you sure. Thank you so much for that. So how was it um, in PA school, like didactic year versus um, clinical year, and being a non-traditional student, how was it um, oh. like for you? PA school was hard. Uh, you know, I was a, I had a three seven six GPA and a and a three eight science GPA. I was a good student, but PA school was hard. I mean, it was the hardest thing I have ever had to do in my life, and um, I was in the Navy with the Marines, and it was. It was hard. I mean, it had been a long time since I really was. I never went to college like most people traditionally. I joined the Navy. So I'd never had the opportunity to just take four or five classes and, you know, I guess, you know, go to a football game and live in the dorm or whatever. I was in the Navy. So I was doing it all kind of on the nights and weekends. And um, all of a sudden, you've got six classes that are the hardest classes you've ever taken. And uh, it was it was an adjustment. I mean, I really spent a lot of hours. I was very lucky because I was married at the time and my wife and I had an arrangement where all I did was PA school and she took care of everything else. If the car needed to go in, we switched cars. She made my food. Um, she would hang up my clothes in the morning. She would, you know, basically do everything. And all I had to do was go to PA school. That's the key for me was if you can ignore everything in life and just be a PA student, you have your best chance. Um, I remember many, many, many nights being in the library till 11 o'clock at night, um, trying to learn as much as I could learn. And uh, it was very hard for me. And, you know, a lot of the younger students um, were very bright and seemed like they didn't have to study at all. Uh, I never saw them in the library, but um, there were some other, there was a, two other veterans that were in my study group and we were there day and night, weekends. I mean, nonstop. Um, and that didactic, so that's didactic, which is hard. And clinical was different. Clinical, I started to feel a little more comfortable because I'd seen patients before. I was comfortable talking with patients. I felt that I had learned a lot in didactic, even though I, I think you learn that how little you know, if that makes sense. You realize that there's too much to know, but um, I felt more comfortable. I felt a little bit of confidence. On my rotations, when I went to the operating room, I felt that I wasn't going to do anything to make a fool out of myself. Um, but still, the nurse was like, don't touch anything blue. Stand in the corner. You know, and I'm like, well, I was a surgical. I don't care. Stand in the corner. Okay. You know, so I, I tried to just, you know, listen and, and keep my eyes open and volunteer to do everything. 
I got to suture. I did some staples. I got to um, do an incision and drainage. I did toenail removals. I did, I mean, I did all kinds of stuff because like everything that was happening, I, I haven't done that. Can I do that? Or oh, chest tube? Can I help with that? I want to do that. Um, so I, I put myself out there and I was really um, uncomfortable a lot, but I, I took advantage of the situation by putting myself, um, exposing myself to every possible thing I could, could do. And uh, I think that's the way to be. That's, that's how you should be as a student. You should be eager to learn. You know, that's mm -hmm. one of the only times you'll be able to learn and, um, you know, have the, be under the guidance. of. Somebody. It's a safe, it's a safe place where, um, you know, you could say, Hey, look, I haven't done a Foley catheter, but I want to do it. Will you, will you stand here to help me do it? And once you've done one, you know, you know it. So, um, a lot of that stuff I had done or I'd seen done, but I'd never done it. You know, we did it on the models and, and all that. So, um, and a little bit in the Navy, you know, starting IVs and, um, that kind of stuff. But, uh, clinicals was very rewarding and really, uh, when you, when you've, build that knowledge base in didactic, it really starts to make sense when you get on clinical rotations. So it's hard, but it's preparing you for, to understand the physiology of what's happening. So. Thank you, thank you so much for that. So um, this part is kind of gonna be twofold because I would love to learn about, you know, your work in psychiatry. Um, then I also wanna learn more about, you know, your work as an academic director. Mm -hmm. And so um, let's start with psychiatry. Um, can you tell us about just like a day in the life from when you clock in to clock out, sure. your patients, um, how you work with your collaborating physician? And yeah, just give us an insight. <laughs> yeah, so I think psychiatry is really great spot for PAs. And I'll tell you why. Once you finish your initial kind of shadowing and training uh, and you're you start seeing your own patients. It's really just you and the patient in the room. Your physician is in the other room in his office seeing patients. So he's not standing there next to you. He's not listening. He's not, um, you know, uh, checking on you every five seconds. You see your patient and then you go to your collaborating physician and you say, okay, I've got this patient. Um, this is what she came in for. And you start to do your oral case presentation and you really, um, spend a lot of time with your patients. And, uh, you know, at the, at, at the beginning, you get a lot of input and a lot of uh, constructive criticism. But um, it's nice if you really want to spend time with your patients and not have um, the physician, you know, if you're, if you're in surgery, the physician's standing right next to you. Or in orthopedics, the physician's probably in the room or will come in the room or I don't, I don't know. But for me, it was just, a, it makes sense because you're building a relationship with your patient, you're getting to know your patient, you're listening to your patient, and, uh, you know, you really get to be almost autonomous, depending on how much your physician trusts you, but um, it's nice because it's, uh, it's hard, but it's, it's um, you can help a lot of people. So, yeah, so that's, um, so as far as the, the day to day, so outpatient psychiatry, is very different than inpatient psychiatry. Um, I have not done uh, inpatient psychiatry at the PA, I did a rotation there, but um, your day starts, you know, eight o'clock in the morning, you have your own office. Um, part of the difference in psychiatry, which is uh, a lot of people have difficulty understanding is you're in your office, the patient comes into your office and sits down, right? When you're in the clinic and other clinics, the patient's in the exam room, you go into the exam room and you see your patient and then you walk out of the room. Well, in psychiatry, you have to get the patient to get up and leave the room because that's your office. So when you're done, you have to say, okay, well, we're all done for today and, you know, head over to the door. Um, so um, you see patients in your office, um, you know, follow-up appointments and new patient intakes is pretty much what you do. I mean, there isn't, there really isn't too much else to um, psychiatry. Uh, you know, my, um, Starting off initially, did some shadowing with all the different physicians and um, had one new patient in the morning, one new patient in the afternoon, and they started increasing, you know, as I started becoming more proficient. Um, generally, the follow-ups are about 20 minutes and the new patients are an hour. Um, and usually you have about six and a half hours of, of patient time and an hour and a half or so of um, admin time to do paperwork, finish charts. 
and whatnot. Um, you know, so you'll see about six and a half hours of, of scheduled patients, um, which is um, probably 12 um, or, or 12 or 16 follow-ups and two new patients, something like that each day. Um, yeah, so um, most of your day is just you and the patient. You see the patient uh, initially, uh, you go to your collaborating position, they'll come in the room. So you'll talk to them, tell them, hey, this is this person they came in, this is what they came in for. They'll come in the room, introduce themselves and uh, let them know that, that you're a PA. Of course, you'll tell your patient that and that, um, you know, uh, what, what, what I told them and if they had any questions or concerns, because we come up with the treatment plan and everything. So they, they really come in just to, just to introduce themselves as the, as the collaborating position. Um, you'll learn about something uh, for the students called incident two billing. So um, once your physician sees the patient at that initial visit, they never see the physician again. Um, they're your patient. So um, as you may not be aware, PAs bill at 85% unless the physician makes the diagnosis. So the physician comes in the office, sees the patient, makes the diagnosis, right? And then you're seeing the patient incident to that diagnosis, they actually get reimbursed at 100%. So um, the physician can sign off on your notes uh, and sign prescriptions if you have controlled substance prescriptions and things like that. But basically, it's you and your patient. Uh, if they want to see the physician or they had a problem, if your collaborating physician is there and you can reach out to them. Um, as you get more and more experience, you reach out to them less. Like, probably been six months since I've really needed uh, any kind of input as far as what to do with a patient. You know, I certainly check in with my collaborating physician anytime I have something that I want them to know about. If I have a patient that's pregnant and taking medications that I'm concerned, antipsychotics, and I'll say, I'm just letting you know, you know, you want to look at this chart because I don't think there's any problems, but this, this is one that I'm concerned about. And I'll, I'll send them the chart or chat with them, text message or, or whatnot. So, yeah. um, yeah so i'm sorry go ahead uh, how was that learning curve to where you didn't you know you were able to practice more autonomously oh boy it's a it's a pretty steep learning curve um you know initially i would get um, chart reviews so we would go through about 20 percent of my charts um every week and it became less and less as i started kind of anticipating what Dr. Ellison initially was my um, initial collaborating position. So I would, could anticipate what he was going to do. And I would say, you know what, I know what he would do in this case. Or I had a patient like this last time, and this is what he suggested I do. So it became less and less. But it's, a, it's a, like any specialty, is a very steep curve. Right. I mean, there's a lot to learn. And um, I read a lot. I still read a lot. Journal articles. Um, I teach the behavioral medicine course, which is probably... Um, one of the, the best parts of my job, but um, it's not traditional for, for clinical PAs to teach um, other than precepting. But um, I have a binder with journal articles that's about this thick. And, you know, I, I would just read and ask questions and watch videos and, you know, because yeah. I wanted to I wanted to be able to take care of my patients as as, as well as possible and to know as much as I could know. Right. Um, so it's a steep learning curve. But it happens kind of when you're not paying attention, all of a sudden you realize, wow, I, I, I know a lot of stuff, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So we have a question from a student. Um, so she said, what would you like to see for the future of the PA profession? She also gave you, um, you know, she also um, commended you. She said, thank you for your service and thank you for continuing to care for our soldiers and veterans. It already is really inspiring to hear your path to becoming a PA. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, so the future of the PA profession, um, my opinion might be a little different than what you guys might be used to hearing. But even though I have my doctoral degree, I don't like the fact that PA is transitioning to or, you know, I hear more and more um, programs are going to be converting or going to start lengthening the program so that they can meet the requirements for a doctoral degree. I don't, it's not going to change the way we take care of patients. So um, we're the last holdout as far as nurses, you have the doctor and nurse practitioners, podiatrists, pharmacists, 
um, ophthalmologists, uh, physical therapists, they're all doctors, right? Not physicians. That's the problem with the English language is um, doctor does not mean physician. I'm a doctor. Yeah. I have a doctoral degree in medical science, but I'm not a physician. Right. So um, I think many, many programs will either have an option to get a doctoral degree. You stay a little longer um, and complete the doctoral degree, um, or they will be uh, just longer programs and you'll get the doctoral degree. It, it's just going to happen, you know, probably over the next 10 years. What would I like to see? Um, that's a really hard question to answer. Um, and I think the problem with medicine is that many providers don't go into primary care because it's probably the lowest paying. Um, but I think it's one of the most rewarding. And I, I guess I'm, um, uh, a little bit of a hypocrite because I went into psychiatry, but um, I would like to see more PAs in primary care because there's such a shortage. So many of our um, older, uh, fastest growing segment of the U.S. population is 90 plus, 85 plus. So a lot of these physicians are retiring. And uh, if we don't go into primary care, there's going to be a hole. Um, and down here in Florida, especially, you know, all of our patients are older. Yeah. So um, I would like to see a lot of people at least start off in primary care and get kind of a well-rounded knowledge, medical knowledge, and maybe take some time and then decide there's this particular specialty that you're really drawn to, or you really love primary care. Um, so uh, I would also like to see more PAs get involved in um, publishing into writing journal articles. You know, I read a lot. And there are really only two journals for PAs. We have the Journal of American Academy of Physician Assistants. And then we have JPAE, which is the PAEA, the Physician Assistant Education Association has a journal that's really about, you know, academia. Um, but I would like to see more PAs published because we see a lot of interesting things. And some of us are very good writers. And, um, you know, I, I really enjoy reading articles that are written by PAs. Yeah. Um, so that's what I would like to see for the future. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, and just to um, end with our session on psychiatry, uh, really quick, uh, really quick, can you also explain to us, you know, patients that you normally see, the patient, how the patient sure. you like? Is it just um, children and adults, or do you only see adults? So when you first start practicing, especially in psychiatry, um, you get to decide what you want to do. Uh, my initial um, foray in the psychiatry was all adults. The, we had two pediatric psychiatrists and, uh, you know, I have two children of my own and I really felt I, I'm not the most patient person and I don't, I just didn't feel that, that I would be good at seeing children. And so I, I initially stayed away from it and just saw adults and it kind of stuck with me. I never went back and um, I think you have to have a desire to work with young people, with children, and I never had that. I, I really enjoyed working with veterans, like you said, and, and adults. And um, so my patient population is 18 plus um, here in Southwest Florida. Probably more than half of my patients are 65 or older. Um, I love old people. Um, I love working with old people. as they, they have the most interesting lives and how they um, ended up in Florida and things that they did and, you know, what kind of jobs they had throughout their life and things like that. Um, as far as a uh, typical patient, um, you know, if you look at the statistics for most common diagnoses, uh, depression, anxiety, um, insomnia, probably top three, insomnia is not really a diagnosis, it's a, it's a modifier, but um, depression, anxiety, obsessive compulsive, um, are probably the top three and then followed by bipolar disorder, um, panic disorder. I see personality disorders. I have um, quite a few patients that struggle with schizophrenia, um, which is, you know, initially very, very frightening to think about somebody with schizophrenia, but it's a fascinating disorder. Um, I have um, probably pretty broad um range of everything that I see, but the vast majority, and I would say, I take that back. So depression, anxiety, insomnia, ADHD is probably up there on the list of very common concerns for patients. Um, 
um, and then bipolar and, and things like that. So, um, yeah, so initially patients are referred either by themselves or by their primary care. Some patients just, depending on their insurance, they can just schedule an intake appointment and their insurance will cover it or their primary care has uh, seen them for depression or anxiety, maybe tried them on a medication and said, you know, I, it's not really working as good or you should see a specialist uh, and they'll send them over to us. Um, so they'll be referred in from primary care. Thank you so much. And um, I think that's it for psychiatry that, as far as questions that I'm thinking of. Um, and if, if you students have any questions, oh, here's a question. <laughs> what do you like least about working as a PA? I don't think there's anything I... I hate to say it, but I love being a PA. I, I um, took the MCAT and had debated applying to medical school and decided that, you know, I would, like I said, I was a non-traditional student. I was a little older and I thought four years of medical school, three to five years of residency, one or two years of fellowship. I said, I really am not the type of person that has to be the, the head guy, the guy in charge. I just wanted to be involved in taking care of patients and do as much as I could for my patients. And I felt um, the PA role was perfect for me because I don't have that desire to, to be the boss. Right. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, I get to help my patients. And honestly, if you looked at my day, um, you wouldn't really be able to tell a whole lot of difference between me and the psychiatrist because I'm in my office seeing patients. He's in his office seeing patients. He has to sign some of my prescriptions here in Florida. But other than that, um, there really isn't much difference. So what do I like least about being a PA? I don't even know if I can. How did I say the charting? Yeah. No. Uh, I don't. Yeah, I mean charting. It's but that's that's part of medicine. I mean the insurance yeah. companies. You got to document what's yeah. going on. So if something somebody else is seeing the patient, you want them to be able to pick up where where you left off if they move or if they um, if something you know you leave the practice and another you don't want the patient to suffer because um, yeah. somebody else is seeing them. So you want to make sure that. Somebody can see what you're thinking, why you made this choice and whatnot. Um, I, I would say that what I like least about medicine, and not specifically being a PA, is the challenges with insurance. So many of my patients, yeah. I had a patient last week that um, was, the appointment was canceled because she had a large balance. She owed the practice money and they wouldn't let me see her. And they said, you can't see this patient because she owes too much money to the practice. And I said, well, I don't care about that's not my problem. She needs her medication. And they said, you, you cannot see this patient. And I was very frustrated with that. And that's happened before. Um, and uh, I was able to convince the practice manager that if she said, you know, she would make a payment and they put her on a payment plan that they would let me see her. And um, she was able to work it out. But I, that's very frustrating to me that, I mean, medicine is a business. It's unfortunate, but you know, the, the building costs money, the utilities, the, the medical system has to be paid, the computers cost money. So, you know, you can't just do it for free. I mean, you could as a community care, but uh, outpatient psychiatry is a business, unfortunately. So that's what I like least about medicine, not specifically as a PA. Right. I totally agree. Mm. <laughs> what was your hardest class in, in didactic year? Hardest class in didactic year. I can tell you my, the most frustrating class was um, clinical reasoning uh, because unfortunately, when you're teaching a course uh, to a, a large group of students, so there were 64 students in my class, you kind of have to, you can't teach at the highest level you can because some students may need more um, and you may need to go a little bit slower. So we started off looking at a history of present illness with a patient and going through each word and saying, okay, 30 year old female. Okay. The patient is 30 years old. The patient is a female. And I'm like, oh my God, I, this is just, I, it was torturous, like pulling teeth. It was, it was a little bit too slow for me, but I understood that some of my classmates had never seen patients on their own. They may have had experience in medicine, but not as providers. So um, that was the most frustrating course. I think the hardest course for me was pharmacology. There is you know, there, you know, there are so many medications, you can't know them all. And you can't know every um, possible drug interaction or every indication or every side effect. Um, but you need to learn as much as you can. So if somebody says, uh, this patient is taking 
gabapentin. You need to know what that is. Uh, well, as a PA, you, you can look it up. But as a student, you need to know what it is and you need to know which class it's in and what the mechanism of action is uh, and what it can interact with. Because if they're taking um, a beta blocker and this other medication and you know, wait a minute, the patient has asthma. You can't give them a non-selected beta blocker. They won't be able to breathe. So it's important to know those things. I, I practice psychiatry. I mean, we rarely use beta blockers, but you need to know that um, non-selected beta blockers will affect the lungs, um, beta two. Um, so uh, that was the hardest thing for me, just the amount of memorization. Um, I, I enjoyed the physiology and the medicine courses because it, it was what I came there to learn. I didn't come to memorize, you know, what um, the three classes of antiarrhythmics. Uh, I, oh. So that was the hardest for me was just memorizing the list of, of all that. And I understood the importance of it, but it was just, it, there was too much. Drinking from the fire hose, there was more than the human brain could learn. Um, but you get as much as you can get. Awesome. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. This is our last question before we uh, learn more about your work as an academic director. Sure. Uh, someone wants to know, what is your strongest suit as a provider? That's a great question. Um, I think my strongest suit, probably from my time in the military, I work very hard to be non-judgmental and to not let things that my patients say to me sway me in one way or the other. If a patient says, um, I, I don't know, if they bring up politics and I avoid politics like a plague because you're going to be, it's very polarized. And if they say, you know, I went to this Trump rally this weekend. Oh, okay. Well, you know, did you, what did, you know, how, how did that go? Or, you know, I don't want them to think, I, they don't know what my political opinions are. They don't know what my, my stance on, on gun control is because it's none of, it doesn't have anything to do with my care for them, really. So I think my biggest strength is that I'm very accepting of people, regardless of where they come from, regardless of their language skills, regardless of their socioeconomic status. I really just, you know, I, I'll give you an example. Uh, sometimes patients will say something to you and you cannot react. Okay. I want my patient to be able to tell me, uh, you know, uh, this weekend, I really thought about killing myself. I, I want my patient to feel comfortable telling me that, not scared that I'm going to say, uh, I don't even know. I, I, I wouldn't know what somebody would say that, that would be bad, but I don't, I want them to feel comfortable that they can tell me that and I can help them with that. Um, I had a patient that told me that um, she couldn't take Ambien, which is um, uh, a sleep medication, because uh, she pulled out one of her teeth with a pair of pliers the last time she took Ambien. And if you react and, and you know, that was one of the most shocking things I've ever heard. Um, and I just said, OK, um, well, I'm going to put that down on your your drug allergy list, even though it's not an allergy, but I'm going to put down that, that we should avoid Ambien for you. And, um, you know, if, so if you react when patients tell you things, they're going to, they're going to think you're judging them. You know, if, you, if they say, well, I went to the abortion clinic and you're like, you know, you can't do that. You can't, you need to let them make their own choices. That's called autonomy. Patients have the right to choose their, what they do, what their care, what, whether they want to do something or not do something. So, my biggest strength is just being accepting for who they are and what they tell me, and I trust them. Great, great. Thank you for that um, great answer. All righty. So um, I think a lot of students are excited for this to <laughs> talk about um, you, sure. what you do as an academic director. Um, can you share how you were able, you know, you did tell us a little bit about um, how you got into the role, but can you tell us more and how, how your day is and how you practice now doing psychiatry? It sounds like um, I'm sure you do psychiatry a day or two a week now. One day a week. Yeah. Tuesdays is my clinical release day. So um, the students know and the other faculty know that Tuesday I'm not available. Um, they still send emails and, you know, on my breaks or if I, if I have a patient that doesn't show up, I'll check my email. But for the most part, there aren't a lot of emergencies in, in academia. So generally stuff can wait a day or two. It's not, it's not urgent. Um, so Tuesdays, I see my clinic, um, all the other days of the week, um, in the summer, um, is very busy for us. So, um, Nova Southeastern starts in May and graduates a class in August. 
So um, right now we have class of 2022 that is in their second to last clinical rotation. We have the advanced didactic students that are in their last semester of didactic. And we have class of 2024, which are just finishing their first didactic semester. So we have two classes on campus and uh, Nova Southeastern Fort Myers takes 55 students per year. So we have 100 and just under 110 um, students on campus and 52 in clinical rotation. So um, it's busy. So uh, a lot happening. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and also I teach the behavioral medicine course in the summer. Um, some programs have a behavioral medicine course. We didn't have one at EBMS, but um, fortunate enough we do. And it's 50 hours of lecture. It's three, three credits. Um, and the semester is only 12 weeks. So every week I teach usually four hours per week. I'm lecturing. Um, so there's that on top of the clinical day and um, all the other uh, things that I do as academic director. Okay. Well, thank you. And um, I was going to ask, uh, just out of curiosity, do you guys do a psych rotation now at NOVA? So, right. So, you know, it, it is a core rotation, but NOVA Fort Myers, we have not been able to find a practice that um, we can consistently get students into. So uh, when you're on your clinical rotations, you will log cases uh, because you're required to see a certain number of different um, diagnoses and a certain uh, variation of patients. So we have our students log their behavioral medicine cases, which you're going to see in every specialty patients have psych diagnosis. They may not be currently being visited or seen for their psychiatric diagnosis, but they're going to have psych diagnoses in pediatrics, in emergency medicine, in surgery, in orthopedics, in ophthalmology, in hand surgery, wherever you are, OBGYN, patients also have psychiatric diagnoses. So we don't have the rotation. Um, EVMS does. I did, uh, I did a psych rotation at EVMS. It's a specialty rotation, so it's not required, um, or it wasn't, it wasn't a required, it's not a required rotation, not a core. Um, so we don't have one, unfortunately. I wish we did. Yeah, I wish you guys did too. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> it sucks, but I mean, at least you, you, I know you've always had the course, though, the behavioral. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, you probably had um, Dr. Coombs or Bert Coombs yeah, that used to teach. Yeah, so I was hired. I was hired to replace Dr. Coombs, who was a, a retired Navy PA, yeah. um, who was a psych PA. Um, yeah. So, what was the other part of your question? Um, I, I don't. Oh, I was asking about like your your work as an academic director. Right. So. A lot of my work, um, you know, we use the Outlook calendar now. I'm not sure how you did it then, but uh, the students have access to the Outlook calendar with the classes. Um, and I basically, um, right now I'm working on the fall schedule, the pharmacology courses, the microbiology course, the um, clinical pathophysiology course. So getting the schedule laid out and confirming with the instructors which topics they're going to teach and what days the exams are going to be and, and that kind of stuff. So I spend a good part of my time planning the next semester. Um, also, uh, answering emails from students about concerns with um, whatever's happening on campus, um, different things that um, happen in their daily lives. So I'm the um, kind of the go to if you're when you're a student, if you have a problem, um, if it's something to do with the class, you can go to your class president. But if it's kind of an individual thing, you can go to your academic advisor. Um, all of our students are assigned an academic advisor, um, and then the next level would be myself and then the program director. So I try to shield or fix problems at the lowest level so that the program director can be doing the program director things. Um, she's very busy also. So um, I, I uh, answer a lot of emails. Um, there are also multiple committees that we sit on, um, curriculum committee, committee on student progress, admissions committee, um, program awards committee, um, program development committee. I'm on a college-wide committee for, um, for another project. Um, so a lot of com committee meetings um, that we um, have to sit through and, and give our input in. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, so the students took an exam this morning 
that, that we have at the end of the didactic semester called the comprehensive didactic. It's a hundred questions. And um, since I'm the academic director, after each exam, I meet with the course director and go through the exam and look at the questions. And we look at the statistics as far as how did the questions perform? What percentage of the students got it right? Um, and and the, um, we use Canvas and it generates some statistics called one called the point by serial, which tells us um, how difficult the question was and how many students got it right or wrong. Um, and we decide if the question was good or not, or we try to figure out if there was a problem with the question. Um, and sometimes we have to, you know, credit multiple answers or something like that, or, or remove a question. So we do that and then the grades are released. So um, each day that there's an exam, I do that after the exam with each course director. Um, we have um, admissions committee. It hasn't, we haven't started interviewing for the class of 2025 yet. Um, I believe they're getting ready to open the date. Um, so Thursdays from 8 to 12 is when we do our um, admissions um, committee. So we have um, 16 students per Thursday that we interview. Um, 30 minute slot starting at 8, going up until noon. Um, so there's uh, three faculty that meet with the student on Zoom. And then th at noon, there's a student session where the current students can meet the incoming or the applicants and ask questions and things like that. Um, so that's coming up. That's, you know, four hours a week. That's a considerable amount of time, but we put a lot of energy into trying to get to know the, the students that are applying. We I honestly believe we look past the grades and the G GREs and everything like that. Pretty much everybody that applies, you have to have a 3.0 um, GPA, science GPA, and your GREs have to be, you know, decent. Um, so we really spend a little bit more time trying to decide, does this student fit in our classroom? Are they going to succeed academically? Um, so we spend a lot of time doing that. Um, and what advice would you give to students that are interested in uh, applying to Nova Southeastern Fort Myers campus? Uh, so there's four. So Nova is a unique. Um, it's just Fort Myers, but Nova is a unique program. We have four campuses in Florida. We actually graduate more PAs than any other school in the country because of our four campuses. Um, we have 55 students, Jacksonville um, and Orlando, um, both have about the same. And then main campus in Davie and Fort Lauderdale has 75 students. So um, we graduate about 220 PAs per year. Um, so um, each program is kind of independent. You apply to, you can apply to all four campuses or just one or two campuses. Um, so uh, if somebody was interested in going to Nova Fort Myers, I would say that one of the best things you can do is try to try to get in touch with either an alumni or a current student to find out, is this a program that would be a good match for what you're looking for? There are some unique um, things about our campus that maybe um, become very important when you become a student, but from interviewing you might not think about so just for example we do not have a cadaver lab um we don't have the capabilities of having a cadaver lab in in fort myers so um if you're looking for a cadaver lab we don't have it uh i i personally did cadaver lab at evms and spent way too much time in the cadaver lab doing dissections and um spent many 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 hours i mean it was very rewarding and and i learned a lot but i think i probably spent a little too much time in the cadaver lab but if you're looking for cadaver lab, we don't have that. Um, what else? Our campus is very unique in that uh, the building is only us and the nursing program on the fourth floor. There are no other students on campus. So when you're taking a class, it's just you and your cohort. There are no surgical assistant students. There's no med students. There's no physical therapy students. There's no dentistry students. It's just PA students. The nursing students have their own thing. Um, upstairs, they do their own thing. So um, we only teach PAs. Um, our campus has one parking lot. You don't have to hunt for a parking spot. Uh, there's always plenty of parking. Um, if you go over to main campus or in Orlando, um, you're going to have to walk 15 or 20 minutes from your car. Um, plus, you're going to have to pay for parking. So we don't have that. Um, that's just one unique thing. We're on the third floor. We have the entire floor. There's nobody else on our floor. Um, but there's classrooms. We have the physical diagnosis lab. We have exam rooms. Um, the faculty offices are there. Uh, on the opposite side of the building. So you'll see us sitting in the back of the classroom. We're right down the hallway. If you need to meet with one of us, you pick up the phone in the lobby and you call over to the faculty suite and you just 
I'll come right in. Um, we have a very, um, I don't know if you say low or high student to faculty ratio. Each faculty has, uh, we have 10 faculty. So each student, each faculty has five or six students, um, in the, uh, didactic portion. So, um, I know all my advisees uh, extremely well and they know me and, um, uh, I am available to them all the time because I don't have that many. So, um, I don't get overwhelmed. Many students go through PA school and, and need very little input from the academic um, advisor and some students need more. So um, that's a huge advantage, I think, of our campus. Um, yeah, so finding an alumni or a current student, um, I like the uh, PA forum, um, you know, the message board that you can go on there. And um, I remember posting on there when I was a student and saying, oh, I, I interviewed on this day. Oh, you, I did too. Oh, I met you. Um, have you heard back? Or, you know, did you interview in the morning or the afternoon or whatever? So, um, oh, I heard, you know, Renee just sent out some some um, acceptances or whatever. So um, I, I like that. Um, it's a good way to get some information. Um, there's an open house. I, I'm not sure. If you look at the Nova Fort Myers PA program, there's a, a listing that talks about an open house that um, Professor Pouillard, the program director, and I do, um, which is like a Zoom meeting where people can come and ask questions. Um, specific to that you get the program director and you can ask the program director a question um, and we get a lot of really great questions that way. So um, another way to uh, find out a lot about the program. And this is a great way. I mean, you know, we didn't we didn't have this. I, I was so excited when I heard about this and I said, you know, I love talking about being a PA and I love talking about Nova Fort Myers. But, um, you know, uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, we have one last question before we move on to the case study. It's a great question. Um, how do you feel? Well, do you, do you feel like that getting a DMSC really prepared you to work in academia? Because I know that, you know, typically they would like you to have a DMSC um, rather than just a master's. Or do you, how, what made you go back to get your DMSC? So uh, majority of the faculty do not have a doctoral degree. Um, the DMSC is relatively new, so some of you may not be aware, but there are multiple different degrees you can get um, after your master's degree. You could get a PhD in philosophy if you want. It's not going to help you as much with um, clinical medicine. Um, you can get a DHSC, which is a doctorate of healthcare or health science, excuse me. Um, so the DHSC is all different health professions, right? Physical therapists, audiologists, um, pharmacists. They wouldn't need another doctor's degree. That's not right. Um, any, any health profession can get the DHSC. The DNSC is only PAs. So the doctorate of medical science is, um, picks up kind of where PA school leaves off. It assumes that you've graduated from PA school and have a master's in physician assistant studies or, um, something similar. Um, so the, um, Lynchburg program has three different tracks. There's the education track, there's a clinical track and an administrative track. So I did the education track. And what we really focus on is a lot of um, compliance with ARC-PA, the accrediting body for PA programs. It's very difficult and very challenging to stay in compliance. We've never been out of compliance in, in Fort Myers. Our Jacksonville program is ha was having some problems at one point. Um, so we spent a lot of time going through the ARC standards and um, also uh, kind of learning how to teach PA students and what makes PA students different. Um, and how to write learning objectives, how to write syllabus, how to, you know, write journal articles. We, we did do some, um, of that kind of stuff, but it's just PAs. So it's a little limited. You're not going to get a view of multiple different health professions, but then again, everybody in your cohort is also a PA. So, um, and in my cohort, the education track, it was all educators. So many of us were, um, directors, either clinical or academic directors or program directors. So uh, I learned a lot from my classmates, and I know we shared a lot of resources as we were going through this program. Um, and uh, I think it um, really helped me to understand how to keep us in compliance and what kind of problems we could run into or how to um, prepare, keep the program prepared for um, the ARC visit every 10 years. So. Um, it's not required though. Most PAs uh, that teach don't have a doctoral degree. They um, are probably working on it um, and, or, you know, are planning on working on it, but many of them don't. Right. 
but it's, it seems like it was a great asset for you being an academic director. It was, it was, it was, um, I had a little bit of my GI Bill left. Um, so that's partly why I decided to go back. And um, I felt that if I didn't go back, um, right before COVID started, I had to enroll. And all through COVID, I was going to school and really kind of opportune time because I couldn't go anywhere, couldn't travel, couldn't go out to dinner and, that, and whatnot. So I was home a lot and um, finished my degree. And uh, so it was, it was good timing for that matter, too. So that's kind of why I did it so aggressively. But uh, yeah, that's why I chose um, to do it. Yeah. Thank you so, so much, um, Scott. Uh, so we are going to uh, move on to the case study. Um, sure. Did you have a PowerPoint or did you want to walk through the case study? No, I'll walk you through it. So I, I um, was thinking of a patient that I saw a couple of years back. So um, let me see, let me bring this over on the other side here. Um, okay. So uh, I was referred a 30 year old female from primary care uh, for anxiety and depression. Uh, she was married, she'd been married for six years. She had two children, um, age four and 10, uh, that both went to, one went to daycare, one went to school during the day. Um, and she was pretty healthy, uh, didn't have any chronic health conditions, didn't take any medication. Um, really just her concerns were um, some depressive symptoms and some anxiety symptoms. Um, she'd been on and off a couple of different antidepressants over the years. Um, with mixed results, her primary care tried her on um, two different medications, and she she didn't feel that they were um, right for her. So her current symptoms were really um, difficulty staying asleep. She was having some problem with um, anhedonia, which is loss of interest in her daily activities. She just wasn't enjoying things that she used to enjoy doing. She had low energy, low motivation. She had trouble getting off of the couch and cleaning, taking care of things around the house. Um, she had loss of appetite. She really never felt that she didn't want to eat, and she started losing weight um, because of her loss of appetite. Uh, and she also had another common problem with um, depression, which is difficulty with concentration. So um, her anxiety and depression made it difficult for her to complete tasks and for her to stay on task. Um, she didn't have any suicidal thoughts or attempts or gestures. She never had any um, suicidal-type um, symptoms. Uh, she'd never been hospitalized for psychiatric reasons. Um, so her depression wasn't to the point where uh, she was a danger to herself or others. So she was treated on an outpatient basis. As far as her anxiety, um, she had the, the kind of um, definition of anxiety, which is uh, constant worry that she couldn't control. Um, she also had some irritability and a lot of muscle tension, you know, in her neck and her back from her anxiety. Um, so, uh, a couple other things from her history. She didn't have any uh, mania or hypomania, so she was not a bipolar patient. She had no history of auditory or visual hallucination, and she didn't have any delusions, uh, and she had no OCD uh, symptoms. So, uh, you know, we go through the typical review of systems. We ask about all the different body systems, and she didn't have any other chronic health conditions. She didn't have any other physical symptoms other than the muscle tension um, and the psychiatric symptoms. She didn't have any drug allergies. She denied using any illicit substances. She's never done any kind of illegal drugs. She was not a drinker. She said she never um, consumed any alcohol. She just didn't, was not a drinker. She was never a smoker and she didn't use any nicotine products. Um, I asked her about her caffeine. A lot of times with anxiety patients, you want to find out how much caffeine they're taking. So she said she drinks two cups of coffee in the morning, uh, one to two diet sodas per day, and usually a medium sized energy drink in the afternoon. Um, so if you're not aware, um, caffeine consumption should be somewhere between 300 to 400 on the top end milligrams per day. Um, and I calculated her caffeine intake somewhere between four and 500 milligrams per day, which is a lot. Uh, her past medications, she's been on Wellbutrin, which is bupropion, um, which is an antidepressant. And uh, it made her very fidgety, which is common uh, with bupropion. And then she was tried on another one, another um, serotonin medication called Paxil paroxetine, um, which made her very nauseous. She tried each of the medications for at least three weeks um, and uh, was referred over at that point because neither one of them was helping. Um, you know, we talked about her history a little bit. She graduated from high school, but she did uh, disclose that she had some difficulty with reading initially in middle school and she had to repeat sixth grade. Um, she did graduate though, she didn't have any college. She was from the local area and lived here her whole life. Her parents were still married. She was an only child. 
Um, like I said, no um, health conditions. Her family history was also negative for chronic conditions and psychiatric conditions. Her mother had some anxiety symptoms, but was never diagnosed or treated, and she didn't have any siblings. Uh, no other family issues with psychiatric issues. Um, and she denied any childhood history of abuse or trauma, uh, nothing like that in her past. Um, so we went through all of her symptoms. Uh, she met the criteria for major depressive disorder and generalized anxiety disorder with insomnia. Uh, and I started her on uh, Lexapro, which is escitalopram, which is a kind of my go-to for serotonin medication, uh, and then saw her back at three weeks. At the three-week mark, she had a pretty good reduction of her depressive symptoms and her anxiety symptoms. Um, and her mood was stable. So I just started seeing her every, every other month and then every three months. Uh, and she was kept on the same medication. Um, so then things kind of got interesting. At about a year, uh, she decided she wanted to go back to college. She was, depression was under control. She wasn't having a lot of anxiety symptoms. She was more motivated. She was taking care of things around the house. She was um, feeling better about herself. So she enrolled in some college classes. And she was really now having a lot of problems with her concentration, which she was having when she was depressed, um, but more to the extent that she couldn't uh, finish tasks. She couldn't get her assignments in on time. And I asked her about her uh, elementary school when she said she had difficulty reading and she had been left back. And she said that she was diagnosed with ADHD as a child. She didn't want to say because she felt that patients with ADHD are labeled as um, you know, um, problem children, or uh, she was kind of embarrassed about her ADHD path. Um, and she told me that her parents didn't believe in medication and uh, never got her treated for her ADHD. Um, so we um, talked about her symptoms, and I did it, a screening for ADHD. She, she was able to find some paperwork from the school from many years back that um, documented that she had a diagnosis of ADHD. Uh, so we talked about trying her on a stimulant, you know, Adderall is our, our first two, um, go to. Um, so we talked about, you know, risk benefits alternatives. Um, and she decided that she wanted to try the Adderall. Uh, she didn't have any cardiac history. There was no important question to ask. No family history of sudden death under age 40, which is an important question to ask patients when you're starting them on a stimulant. Uh, so we started her on a low dose of Adderall, um, 10 milligrams twice a day, and I saw her back three weeks, and she said she had some initial improvement, um, but it only lasted maybe two and a half to three hours, and then she felt that it was kind of wearing off. So we raised her up to 20 milligrams twice a day, and saw her back in three weeks, uh, and she felt that she was doing much better. She was getting four or five hours of good focus and concentration. Um, so I started seeing her every other month and every third month. Um, her mood was stable. She wasn't having any problems with anxiety. Um, and uh, the one of the visits, probably about nine months after she was started on Adderall, um, hindsight, she was complaining about her neighbors. She said that she was having some problems in the neighborhood. Her neighbors were um, basically they all hated her for whatever reason. She felt that they were all just not happy with her. They were talking about her, laughing at her. Every time she came outside, they were laughing. Um, and, uh, you know, every time they saw her, she said her husband was starting to act suspicious about her uh, all the time, saying that, you know, he was worried what she was up to, going to these classes or whatever. Um, I, I didn't pay a whole lot of mind to it at the time. Um, there wasn't any clear um, anything really going on. I referred her to therapy because it seemed like she was having some difficulties. Uh, she saw the therapist uh, uh, about three weeks later, and then at the second visit, the therapist sent me a message through the portal system saying that um, she was having uh, severe paranoia and auditory hallucinations. She was having, she heard voices. Even at night, she said she could hear the neighbors talking about her. Um, so uh, this basically turned out to be a stimulant-induced psychosis, which is unfortunately not the first time that I've seen this. I've seen it a few times. Uh, we stopped her stimulant, the paranoia and the persecutory delusions and the hallucinations uh, actually got worse. Um, so we put her on an antipsychotic medication and her symptoms started to get a little bit better. But um, it's really a textbook case of stimulant induced psychosis, which um, I, I think is one of the most interesting cases that I've had in a long time. Because when I look back and I said, why didn't I recognize that all of a sudden she was having this paranoia and that you know, her, her neighbors were talking about her. 
uh, and laughing at her. And it just, it, it didn't, I didn't pay any mind to it at the time, but um, I should have probably seen it earlier. Um, luckily, the therapist was that she disclosed to the therapist what was going on with her. And we were able to get her, um, you know, on an antipsychotic medication to get her uh, symptoms under better control. Yeah. So that's um, what else? Any questions about that case? I mean, it's super interesting. Let's see. Uh, uh, no, it's, you basically answered it. They want to know was it. Oh, a underlying issue. issue? Yeah. So uh, there's no way to know if somebody is going to develop um, uh, psychosis from a stimulant. And if she had, if her life was different and she'd been a drug addict um, and she was on some kind of like methamphetamine or whatever, she probably would have been psychotic. Um, it would have ended up happening anyway. So um, for some reason, and we don't really understand why, but in a, a long in a few um, rare cases patients develop psychosis and sometimes when we stop the stimulant it doesn't it doesn't go away um yeah so her, she, she still suffers from the same symptoms she's still on antipsychotic medication and um she uh unfortunately um had some weight gain from the antipsychotic medications we tried taking her off and changing to a different um antipsychotic medication but uh they didn't really control her symptoms as well so um, she had a little bit of weight gain, but she's doing much better because her symptoms, she doesn't have the auditory hallucination and she's not um, paranoid. So she's, she functions well. Um, she unfortunately had a little bit of weight gain. That was really the worst part of it. Oh, good, good. So she based the symptoms eventually resolved after. They resolved, but she's going to be on, you know, that's, that's what I always say about schizophrenic. So patients will say, how long do I have to take this medication? Unfortunately, if you stop taking the medication, there's a very high chance that your hallucinations and delusions are going to come back. So um, you're on that um, medication forever. How many patients do I see? Um, now I see the chat. I had, to, I had it minimized before I didn't see it. I see the chat now. Um, so, it, well, uh, so because I only see clinic once a day, um, I convert it over to a uh, production basis. So I'm not on a salary with with the practice. So they pay me per patient. Um, so they usually cram my schedule pretty full. I usually see about 18 follow-ups and one or two new patient um, per Tuesday. So uh, yeah, 18 or so, and then one or two new patients. So if it's 20 minutes per, um, that's six hours of follow-ups and then the new patients are an hour. So um, it's usually eight hours of patient care time, but I only do it once a week. So it's not, um, and I've become very proficient with my charting uh, that I can finish my charts the day that I, that I see my patients when I'm seeing them. So um, it doesn't flow into other days, uh, but it takes a long time to get proficient. Yeah. So um, we'll answer one more question um, before we, I know it's a little past time. I don't want to keep you. We'll answer one more question. Um, how do you separate your work life and your uh, separate my work life. Uh, oh, and somebody asked, why not a nurse or a physician? Oh. Uh, yeah, so I'll answer both. So uh, nursing is a different type of medicine. Um, you know, uh, as a corpsman, I, I really wanted to play a larger role in taking care of my patients. Um, nurses are essential. Nurses provide uh, care that, that we cannot do because we're providers. So it's a different type of uh, position. Um, I chose not to go to medical school because when I retired from the Navy, I was 40 and I figured I'd probably be 50 by the time I really started seeing patients. And I didn't have the desire to be the man, you know, the doctor. So I really just wanted to take care of people and get involved in helping people. So PA school was really a great route for me. Um, sometimes with psychiatry, I think it is hard to separate um, my work life and my personal life. Uh, unfortunately, um, in psychiatry, if you have some of your own challenges, sometimes patients hit a little close to home. Um, sometimes patients struggle with things and it's hard to um, let go of it. Uh, you know, I talked to the students about the difference between sympathy and empathy. Um, so sympathy, anybody can have sympathy. It's like, oh, I'm sorry, you're not feeling well. You know, I hope you feel better soon. Empathy is, oh, you have COVID. I had COVID. Um, wow, that's really, man, I had a hard time with it. So you can relate to what they're going through when you're empathetic. Um, and in psychiatry, uh, it's 
hard to almost not be too empathetic with, especially my combat veterans. Uh, sometimes I forget, you know, that, that I'm the provider and they're the patient and I want to help. And I just want to talk to them and help in any way I can. And it's, um, sometimes it affects me and it shouldn't, but sometimes it sticks with me. Some of the patients that I've seen and some of the bad outcomes that I've heard about, uh, are difficult to let go of. Um, as far as the academics, it's pretty easy to separate. Um, the students don't, you know, there aren't any academic emergencies. Hey, we have a test tomorrow. I need to know what this answer is. No, that's not an emergency. I'm not going to answer that. I don't check my email in the evening. So that um, doesn't happen. Um, so I um, make it a priority to do things that I enjoy doing. So I um, have a kayak. The neighborhood we live in actually has a boat launch. And um, there's a um, there's a creek from our neighborhood to um, the, it's called the Caloosahatchee River. Um, so I kayak every day. Um, I also on the weekends uh, bike ride. I'm actually watching the Tour de France right now. I love I love bike riding. Um, so I go on long bike rides um, and I read. Um, I just started rereading a really great book by a gentleman named Atul Gawande, and the book is called Checklist Manifesto. Have you read it? No. It is great. It's so Dr. Gawande is an endocrinology surgeon, and he talks about the why do we have bad outcomes in medicine? And he goes through a bunch of different cases that he meets a friend from medical school and they're talking about different cases. So it's medically related and it's basically teaching you why do we use checklists in medicine and what's the purpose of a checklist? And it's, it's like, I read it maybe six or seven years ago and I forgot how great this book is. Um, um, yeah. The other book I would recommend is Malcolm Gladwell. Um, wrote a book called Blink, which is another phenomenal book um, about first impressions. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell, uh, it's not a physician, I don't think, but he's a phenomenal writer. What did you say it was called? If I can type it for the students. Uh, oh, Malcolm Gladwell's book is called Blink. Um, Atul Gawande, G-A-W-A-N-D-E, uh, is um, Checklist Manifesto. Checklist Manifesto. He's written a bunch of books um, and really great. Uh, yeah. Great. And the other book, um, well, I don't know if you guys would get it. House of God. I don't know if you read House of God, but it's about um, hospital medicine in the 70s and 80s. And it's, um, it's a little satirical and a little uh, kind of almost inappropriate, but um, really interesting book. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you can, um, I guess if you're, if you're allowed to share my email, I'm always happy to, um, you. you know, answer questions with students. I can't really tell you, you know, if you're going to ask me what, are, what are, what are they going to ask me in my interview? I'm yeah. not going to tell you, I can't really meet yeah, with students cool. and, but you know, you know, I'm happy to, um, I, I don't know. I, I can't read your personal statement or anything like that, but, um, right. you know, I, I, um, I'm very pro student. I, I'm always talking to students about, um, you know, trusting their instincts and trusting their gut and that, um, I, I don't know. I just, I love my students. I love working with them. I, I really see the best in people. Um, so I'm happy to, you know, um, I don't know. I'm still very energetic and excited about medicine. I haven't gotten that, um, you know, uh, some people get a little bit despondent or jaded. Um, and I still love medicine. Thank you so much. So um, thank you. I shared your email. Um, okay, great. Yeah, thank you so much for doing that. Um, I'm sure they'll appreciate it. And I hope you guys don't flood him. <laughs> no, but come, you know, go on the Nova Fort Myers and look about the um, the open house because it'll be on Zoom and Professor Couillard will be there. And I could probably email you a link to it if I can find yeah, it. Yeah, and I then you can, can you can post it and then... Um, you can come to the uh, virtual open house and um, ask questions to the program director and myself and the clinical director. You know, we had questions about how many rotations or where are my rotations? Do I have to arrange my own rotations? We do all that. Um, so lots of really great questions that um, uh, will get answered then. So.
right, so before we go, I always ask our guests um, if they can have, give the students one last advice, one last takeaway, something you know you just want them to leave with, what is that? What would you want them to know? The most important thing uh, that I would say, the, how are you gonna get into PA school? You need to be yourself, okay? If you say to me, and I ask you, why do you want to be a PA? And you say role flexibility or lateral mobility. I'm going to, I'm going to punch you in the face. Okay. <laughs> that is the text. I don't want to hear the answer that you think I want to hear. I want to hear why you want to be a PA. I want to know why are you doing this? Because this is the hardest thing that you're ever going to do in your life. And if you really don't believe that you're doing it for the right reason, you're going to quit. You have to, because it's going to get hard and you're going to question your motives and your, your reasoning. So you have to be yourself. You need to let me know who you are. I don't want you to answer the question the way you think I want to answer it. I want you to answer the question the way you would answer it. Right. So don't try to think of the right answer, the wrong answer. Be yourself. That's what I would say. That's how you're going to get into PA school. And if you don't get accepted at that school, it wasn't meant to be. Um, so just be you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I always say that, say that as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Kane. Um, it was great having you. Yeah, I appreciate it. Sharing your, your story, your experiences as a PA and um, work as an academic director. Thank you, thank you, thank you for everything that you've done and for helping the students. And sure. I wish you a wonderful night. Have a good night, guys. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye, guys.